OK. And I'm just double checking. You heard that, right? Yes, I heard that. Yes, we did. We are live and I'll turn this off at the beginning. Hi, everybody. This is Karina Hami. Welcome to our first uh, all virtual um, Azure government meetup. Um, of course, uh, I think everyone's hunkering down in their home offices uh, because of the coronavirus. And it was really important for us to continue uh, delivering this content to everyone while we're all um, practicing some safe social distancing. So hopefully you're all nice and cozy at your home office and you can enjoy uh, the content um, that we're delivering tonight. Um, as I start off all the time, I want to thank our presenters for sharing all their best practices and, um, and knowledge of what we're doing in government today and in, in government cloud and on Azure. So um, with that, uh, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is uh, Karina Hami. I'm uh, the founder of our um, Azure Gov meetup, um, also at um, Microsoft uh, Azure Government Engineering Team, and uh, very happy to uh, welcome everybody tonight. Um, Vishwas Lille, um, I'm not sure if he could join us tonight, uh, but he's also a co-founder, um, very knowledgeable. He's an MVP in um, Microsoft uh, um, Azure, so that means he knows everything Azure. So uh, definitely uh, reach out to either of us if you have questions uh, or want to uh, volunteer. So why are we here? We always like to start off um, our meetups. Uh, typically, we're all at um, downtown DC at 1776, but uh, tonight I'm glad we could uh, meet each other virtually. And we're here really to create a community of practitioners and uh, as I mentioned before, um, uh, share best practices and learnings, uh, case studies, and really be able to create that dialogue um, with one another. So with that, we're going to have uh, we're going to have some very cool uh, demos we have for tonight. And uh, if you have questions, please pop them up in the IM window and we'll address them as we're going or at the end of each presentation. So please, uh, we'd love that engagement from you. And then please help us grow the community. If you like to tweet, um, our hashtag is hashtag AzureGovMeetup. And again, we're always seeking those volunteers. So if you have a great idea or best practice, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to share them uh, with with us. So uh, for the time being, our uh, meetups will be virtual until told otherwise. Um, so our next meetup is April 29th. We're already putting that agenda together. It's on um, government modernization, um, IT modernization with cloud. So if you have any great um, speaker ideas or would like to present yourself, uh, please send me an email. It's at khami at microsoft.com. So uh, don't uh, be shy or RSVP to that meetup. We'll send out a virtual link and uh, join each other in our next meetup. So with that, we'd like to always give kind of updates on what's going on. Um, Microsoft Builds, which was uh, May 19th to 21st, is now they announced that will be virtual. So uh, just like this meetup, you'll be able to attend and get the latest and greatest uh, live from, from all the speakers uh, and presenters. Um, so don't uh, check that out. And um, uh, also, if you haven't checked our blog recently, we've done a lot on Azure government uh, platform. We've had 21 new services in Federal Pi. So that's 101 uh, total. Um, we're excited as part of the Azure government uh, engineering team to have released 29 new services. Uh, but at the end of March, uh, don't be surprised if you see those numbers creeping up over 40. Uh, we're really working hard at 
giving everybody that commercial innovation in government cloud so that there really is parity between all our clouds at any data classification. So check out our blog, um, also the Azure blog, and there's uh, Azure updates if you're really just looking for those uh, service updates. Um, so with that, let's go right into the agenda. As I said, we have four amazing um, speakers tonight, and, and we're going to get into demos. Each speaker will have about 20 minutes. Um, please don't hesitate to send uh, in your questions, and uh, we'll get we get going. So with that, here are our speakers. Uh, we have TJ um, from Microsoft. He knows about anything and everything that has to do with security. Love working with them. And then Eric and Sean are from Tech Trend. Uh, they have a great presentation on DevSecOps. Uh, and then Christian, he'll follow up on a cool demo around drones. And then we'll um, circle back to Toby and end with a, a, another really cool uh, demo around bots. So with that, uh, I think we'll have a lot to kind of discuss and digest and we'll kind of take you around all possibilities of solution. So with that, we're going to talk about Zero Trust with TJ. TJ, it's all you. Thank you, Karina. I'm TJ Benasic. I'm a senior program manager with Microsoft in the Azure government and, and engineering group. In this session, we'll be exploring zero trust and how we can secure identity within Microsoft Azure. The first question is, what does it mean to us? What do we want to learn and take away from this topic? To put it bluntly, the reason we're talking about zero trust is because the on-premise defense in depth model has really failed. In 2010, Forrester produced a white paper, which is the, the foundation of, of what Zero Trust is today. Uh, John Kinderwack was one of the authors, and he described it best by saying that the defense in depth model is similar to an M&M to where we did everything possible to harden our perimeter, keep the threats on the outside and our business on the inside. And if we could just maintain that hard shell, the attackers wouldn't get into the GUI center. And we know that the average attacker will uh, compromise credentials readily with phishing. They will, within one to two hours of compromising those credentials, use them. Within 24 hours, they will circumvent a VPN. And within two to three days, a capable attacker will own domain access rights to your entire environment. As Cyber defenders, it takes us an average of 144 days to detect that threat. So obviously we need to think about doing things differently. We need to think about instead of our users being constrained within an on-premise uh, perimeter-based environment to being more than our users, to being our partners, our suppliers, our vendors, uh, and using more than just our gold images, using BYOD devices, uh, IoT, personal devices, mobile devices, and not just connecting from within our office, but connecting all over the globe where we do business. And this is where the zero trust model really brings benefit and utility to what we're doing in cybersecurity. The first thing I wanna do is cut through the hype by talking about what zero trust is not, an easy foundation to get started with. So if any of you went to RSA this year, you would see every booth in security talking about how this product or that product is zero trust, and it becomes really confusing. What does that mean? And I like to give the example of being on a battlefield. If, if I'm on a battlefield uh, and I'm fighting the enemy, um, anything could be of help in doing that. So if there's a hammer on the ground, like I could pick it up, would it be any good? Like maybe it couldn't hurt, um, maybe there's a shield, like, do I want to fight with that? Probably not my first choice. I can't wield the thing like Captain America, but okay, everything helps. And, and that's kind of a similar approach with zero trust. And it leads to a lot of hype and a lot of misunderstanding as far as what zero trust is. So we know what it's not. It's not literal. You can't sit there and run a business or an enterprise by saying, the truth is out there, trust no one. No one's accessing my environment. You'll never touch it. 
I'm just going to disable right click the keyboard and everything, and then I'll be completely secure. And as, as much as security professionals think that'll solve the problem, it isn't feasible in a business environment. So it's not a little literal application. We, we do need to make trust. It's not an adjective. So there isn't a point on your zero trust journey to where your CISO is going to march in, throw out zero trust t-shirts. We're all going to high five each other and say, hey, we made it. Uh, it's a journey. It's, it's not a description of a state. This is very unfortunate. We can't go out and buy it. There isn't a single tool that we can go and buy and say, oh, I've got my firewall, I've got my endpoint, I've got my SIM. Let me go ahead and throw zero trust in there. Fortunately, that's not the way it works. We can't just buy it and apply it within our environment. It's not instant. Like, wait a minute, you're saying it's not instant. All right, too hard to quit. We know we can't boil the ocean. We need to make incremental steps based in best practice and proven methodologies. And it's not a revolution. You don't need to go throw away all the investments you've made. We all live in in hybrid and multi-cloud environments with distributed investments in security technologies. And what you'll find is a lot of the foundations of zero trust are based in best practice. And we'll talk about that in, in our compliance. But the takeaway from that is uh, start with what you have as a foundation and, and build upon it. You don't need to restart or, or not leverage the controls and the investments that you've already made. So what are our principles of zero trust? In Microsoft, we produced a zero trust model, which you guys can find on the website. But the three major takeaways are it's a mindset. You need to think about operating in a pervasive risk environment. So within that environment, every request for resources or access is verified explicitly through different authentication methods. We don't want the attacker to breach our perimeter and then have the freedom to move within our environment. We want multiple explicit verifications in that path to trust. We want to use least privilege access and, and security professionals will harp on this again and again. But we need to think about applying role based access control and getting very granular in that. Uh, we don't need to give out blanket administrative rights. Uh, what type of administrator are you? Are you an application administrator, a security administrator, a data administrator? Uh, we can finally tune those to exactly what the role is and better control what that elevated privilege should be in, in accessing our environment. And we should think about not just granting that as a, a blanket end all be all, but maybe just granting it for, for use cases such as I only need my administrative functions when I'm working on my application. So maybe give me those those features within my change window, log them then and then revoke them at the end of that. And we'll talk about that with with just in time access. And lastly, and most importantly, assume breach uh, the mindset that we're going to harden that perimeter with as many network appliances as we can have and consider ourselves safe with those investments. I, we've moved beyond that mindset, so we need to think about containing breach. We need to think about when the attacker breaches our perimeter, what controller are they going to hit next? How far are they going to be able to go? So assuming breach and operating in a, a risk pervasive environment. So what does that mean to us in, in the federal cloud community? We need to think about how we can align zero trust based on federal standards. Right now there currently is not an audit framework to do this. Um, so we need to build on the available uh, documentation and compliance frameworks that we have. The first is NIST 800 SP, uh, excuse me, NIST SP 800 207. This is very recently published by NIST and it outlines a zero trust architecture. So this document provides an outstanding framework for what type of architecture you need for policy enforcement points, uh, security concerns, and in the type of architecture you need to build to be able to uh, enable this type of a model. Secondly, we have Trusted Internet Connections, which has been around for some time uh, via a DHS and SISA and an OMB collaboration. Trusted Internet Connections, being that it has maturity and, and widespread use in the federal government, is a great standard because it's very granular as far as what type of controls need to be applied for a zero trust type environment. Uh, there's also a lot of other great resources out there like uh, Continuous Diagnostic Monitoring and the NIST Cybersecurity Framework. So in Azure government, we recently released a six part blog series covering how do you implement zero trust with Microsoft Azure and within the series, we focused on six major focal points, uh, secure and identity, cloud workload protection, SIM policy, insider threat and supply chain risk management. 
So within each of these blogs, and, and I'll provide links for you guys at the end, we start off with talking about how do we align what we know in these compliance frameworks, uh, where the commonality is, and looking at how we apply that with a Microsoft implementation, and then rolling down into quick steps for how you can implement these in your environment. Tonight, we're exploring 12 steps to implementing Zero Trust for identity management principles. So what we've created with each of these blogs is a, a step by step guide for initial and starting points that you can deploy in your environment to to move towards this, this Zero Trust model on, on your journey for digital transformation. In the demo, what I'd like to do is talk about a few of those steps and show you how you can do this stuff within Azure. So let me go ahead and flip over to my environment. So the first step we want to do is an employee and identity management system. Within Azure, it is the Azure Active Directory offering. So several ways to get there. When you come into Azure, you could click on the icon. You could search it up in the bar over here or go down to the blade and select Active Directory. So when we come into the overview, we can see that we have our identity management platform. We need to evaluate what type of trust uh, relationships that we have applied and what type of organizational relationships that we have in place. So the nice thing is we can go to Azure AD Connect and think about the schema that we want for Active Directory. A lot of us have hybrid environments. There is not a one size fit all. So we have a very flexible model. We can look at federating our user sign-ins. We can look at SSO, pass-through authentication, or maybe trusting within organizational relationships. You can see in here, we could go down and configure identity providers and look at uh, SAML, WSFED, and other federated uh, approaches to identity management. What I wanna show for this use case is how we would create uh, a user, give them administrator rights, and start to control that within our zero trust principles, looking at conditional access, multi-factor authentication, privilege identity management, uh, access, and, and things of that nature. So we'll start off within AAD. Uh, you saw that I clicked on users. We're now on all users. I'll go to create a new user. Give that a moment to load up. There we go. I'm not going to create a user named Corona tonight. This user is going to be John Doe. We've got our, our fictitious domain right here. First up, consultant 787, and that's where we're going to be creating this user. I'm going to auto generate a one time password so I can share that with John Doe. And if I want to put in more metadata as far as possibly blocking a sign in until it's ready for provisioning or maybe putting metadata in the gal, I could do that here. So I'm going to create that user and you see that John Doe is now created. Next one I want to do is grant administrative rights to John. So I'll select the user. It will bring me into a profile with some of the configuration settings that I can make for John. And first thing I want to do is go to assign roles. Add assignments. And we know that John is an administrator, but when we're providing this access, uh, we feel that's too broad. We want to talk about that role based access control from our zero trust application. So what we're going to do is tailor it down to John's specific role. So we have about 100 built in uh, RBAC roles in here, or if that isn't enough, you can custom create it. But the nice thing about this is you have the freedom to do that. So for John, he's going to be an application administrator and we will add that role. So it's popped up. Next, we want to control how that access is made with uh, MFA and conditional access. So I'll go back to my Azure Active Directory blade. Now, there's a few ways that I can apply this. Uh, I like to roll down here to security and click it here. I could also go from the user's blade and select MFA. 
Uh, security is nicer. It's got a little bit more full featured look at things and it allows me to uh, apply conditional access and policy. So that's why we're going in through this method. So within security, I'll select conditional access. And we want to create a new policy. What we're going to call this is uh, MFA for administrators. We're going to apply this to John. So to do that, we would go to select users, uh, click on user. And select. And there's John. Now here I could go into clouds or applications or I could possibly just apply it to all. Oh. There we go. Another nice thing is we can go down into conditions and select some of the conditions that we want. There's different things that we can apply within conditional access. We can talk about how to configure sign in risks. So if the device comes in at medium uh, high risk, you know, apply that policy. Then if it's low risk, say from a trusted location with a trusted image and time of day, maybe then we wouldn't apply it. We can talk about which device platforms we want to apply this to. Maybe I only want John Doe working on a Windows machine, so we could configure that. Locations could be trusted IPs within my organization or, or maybe by geolocation. Client applications, a method of uh, the client that uh, you're going to access that environment from, and device state. So uh, is it a healthy device? Is it non healthy? It's similar to uh, NAC policies. Then we want to go to granting access control. So this is where we're going to set the policy to grant access upon MFA. I can also add a few more to those conditional access. I can say that I also want that device to be marked compliant. Maybe I want it coming from a, a hybrid environment on an approved app with an app protection policy. And I can say, do I want all of those or do I want just one of those? For this one, we'll say I want all of them. Enable the policy, yes and create validation successful now we can see that our policy is in place the next step in our, our zero trust application is looking at controlling access this is a very hard thing to do in the environment to determine exactly what users have what privilege level and how do we police that so several ways to do this uh, easiest i'd say is go to users say you want to drill down just on john doe and figure out what type of roles and, and access that he has so we'll go back to our user blade and click on john doe and then select assigned roles and we can see that we've assigned john as application administrator now, the nice thing is when you move to a fuller featured offering of Azure Active Directory like the uh, Premium P2, you start to get a lot more of the bells and whistles. And these things are, are very applicable to what we're doing in Zero Trust, especially a feature called Privileged Identity Management. Now, this is a way to monitor administrative access, apply it uh, time bound, uh, IP bound, access bound, and then audit and alert on this. So fantastic feature, and I'll show you guys how we do that. So a few places we can get to it. I'm going to go to identity governance. So some of these features that I have, I can create an access package. Um, look at access reviews. This is very good if you need to review multiple administrators or do a bulk export or possibly align that with 
uh, a configuration management platform like Azure Security Center, or maybe even a SecOps platform uh, like our SIM, Azure Sentinel. And we have our privileged identity management blade. So I'm going to go into that one and manage role assignments. So what I want to do for this for Zero Trust is to manage access. Say that giving John Doe blanket access to application administrator isn't the way to go. I want to get more granular and provide the, the absolute least privileged access to this environment. I'm going to add a member. That's going to be John. We're going to give them scope of the entire directory for now as an example. Uh, really, this use case would work a lot better if I'm the change officer during a change window. I could give uh, John Doe as an app administrator access to just his resources. So we're going to say that he would be an app administrator just within the scope that we're applying. All right, select a member. There's John. In membership settings, most important. So pretty cool as far as what we can do here for the feature. So we can say that uh, maybe this is where we want to assign an administrator. We can make him permanently eligible, meaning when I assign him admin rights here, similar to the other blade with an AA to users, he would be permanently eligible. But the great thing about this is I can make it active, non-permanently assigned, or I can make it eligible. When it's eligible for John to use these rights, he would have to ask me for permission and I as a global admin would grant it. So let's say that my change window is tonight and that's when John's gonna be making his maintenance changes on his application. So we're gonna say that these rights are only eligible between eight and 10 p.m. tonight. I certainly don't want to provide those rights for an entire year, so let me go ahead and back that one up. There we go. So what this means when I grant this is John will only have application administrator rights within that time window when I approve it as being eligible. And the completion of that window, it will blow away those rights and John would uh, return to the normal uh, user rights that he had. And that, and that's in place. So last thing I wanted to show you guys is just looking at an audit, and that's another thing within identity management is, is how do we review uh, activity within our environment? So the nice thing is when you roll down the AAD blade to sign-ins and audit logs, We've got quite a few capabilities. We can look at the logs organically within our, our, our query language, which is uh, the Custo query language, KQL. I can get a heads up display of what sign-ins I've had within my environment. I can go to audit logs if I need to look at a specific user. I can go into uh, insights to make determinations on what's going on with my environment, maybe look at resource utilization or admin utilization. If someone isn't using their admin a lot, it would give me a recommendation to say, hey, maybe you should revoke that admin or maybe they're, they're overly permissive in rules. Uh, or I can go to workbooks. I can create heads up dashboards. I can do playbook automation and uh, integrate with a lot of those other Azure security capabilities like ASC and Sentinel. So that completes our demo portion. I'll roll back to the slides. So I want to close out with uh, this final point. Zero trust is a journey, just like digital transformation. And when you look at these folks uh, navigating the boat, you wouldn't want to be out in this type of weather flying a kite because there's 30 mile an hour winds and it would surely blow away. But they're navigating successfully with their sailboat. If you look over there and you see the rocks, you, you wouldn't want to go over there and crash on the rocks because it would surely sink your boat, but they're doing so successfully. And if you look at the water, you certainly wouldn't want to go swim in. It's 40 degrees and you get hypothermia and drown, but they're doing so successfully. So this is a journey with zero trust. We need to learn to operate within a risk pervasive environment. And if you follow the steps and principles, you too can be successful in your journey. So bon voyage.
And I'd like to close out with a reference to our six-part blog series. You guys can find that on the Azure Government blog. I believe we're working on publishing an ebook, rolling these together as well. I've got a few links in there, and I believe we'll make the slides available. And I'd like to open it up for a few questions before we transition to the next demo.